lecture, we're going to be looking at chapter six, and that is going to be about social network, mobile commerce, and online auctions. So let's start with the learning objectives. So the module level learning objectives for this module for chapter six are going to be explain how social networking emerged from virtual communities, describe how social networking websites earn revenue and how companies use social networking in e-commerce, Identify mobile technologies used in business online and emerging mobile commerce trends. Understand the role of auctions and auction related businesses in e-commerce. We're all familiar with social media. It's a part of everyday life for most of us. However, social media is relatively new when it comes to technology as well as when it comes to business. It's incredibly new. The relationship between electronic commerce and social networking is young, but it is very influential currently. Today, we can connect with companies and be influenced by friends, family, celebrities, and with just the tap on our screen, we can make a purchase. So let's look at how we got to where we are now from the beginnings of virtual communities. So virtual communities started out um, mostly as virtual communities that were bulletin board systems. It allowed users to connect via phone lines and read and post messages. It was mostly free, but some had um, some places charged a fee. A virtual community is a gathering place for people and businesses with no physical existence. Um, individuals and companies with common interests meet up online. They can discuss issues, share information, generate ideas, and develop valuable relationships without the constraints of geography. Companies can make money by serving as relationship facilitators to those virtual communities and social networks. Um, it combines the internet's transaction cost reduction potential with communication facilitator role. Online communities grew into the social networks that we see today. Um, social networking sites allow individuals to create a profile, publish um, their profile picture, um, and a list of other users whom they share a connection with, um, or multiple connections, and they can control the list and monitor similar lists made by other users, and they can continue to um, be sharing information in that way. If you look at the figure on page 262, it shows a timeline of social networking. And so it's going to start in 1997 with six degrees. Um, and so we're not going to be looking so much at the bulletin board um, system one, but we're going to be looking at starting with six degrees in 1997, how that sort of started to take off, but it just wasn't really getting going. And then in the very early 2000s, you start having more things like like LinkedIn and Friendster and MySpace, et cetera, until um, in 2004, the emergence of Facebook, and in 2006, Facebook took off and has been a leader since then. But if you look at that chart, you're going to see how it has evolved over time, and you'll notice that, um, you know, there's been a ton happening just in the recent years, although the chart doesn't go past 2014, um, so there's six years more of growth that's happened since then, but we can at least see that really big cluster of growth that happened in the early 2000s. Early social networking sites like Six Degrees, they didn't have as many options as we have now, but that is where it started. Um, then you also have places like LinkedIn that are dedicated to a specific area. So LinkedIn is career-based, um, you also have some social no networks that are focused around specific interests or capabilities, um, things like Flickr and Pinterest, um, even Instagram falls into there because it's picture based. Um, and then you have Twitter, which allows users to send short messages or tweets to each other. Um, and that counts as a microblog, actually. The expansion of social networking sites into all corners of the world um, has been very successful. There's also other places tend to have their own local language sites and those emerge in countries and often countries choose to stick with their own local language sites that can meet their needs better and meet their cultural needs. And um, you can also see in the book, there's a map of like what apps are the most, what social networking apps are the most prevalent in each country. Since the, we have internet everywhere, we're able to integrate all of these possibilities. And we're able to um, have mobile social networks where mobile devices transmit their location to websites and then sites use that location information 
to provide customized advertising and other services. We also have virtual learning networks. So Blackboard counts on that. Um, you know, it's distance learning platforms um, for us to interact with each other. And they have tools like bulletin boards, chat rooms, drawing boards. Um, there's a lot of parts of Blackboard that we're able to use um, to communicate with each other. As individuals, we know a lot of things that we can do on social networking, of connecting with friends and family, um, all kinds of things that we can do online through social networking. However, let's look at the business side of it. So businesses have been criticized throughout social media for, for creating accounts that are really just advertisements. And at the beginning, they got a lot of flack for that. Uh, now we expect to see advertisements when we're on social media. Um, and experts, though, agree that social media should be managed differently than other advertising efforts. So social media gives a chance for businesses to connect with customers in a way that they normally can't. You can be seeing all the information and communicating with them and be having that dialogue with them through the comments section or through the instant messaging options. And so that's something that businesses can take advantage of and businesses need to take advantage of to advertise differently, interact differently, create relationships with their customer. And that brings us to um, social shopping sites. Social shopping sites are things like Craigslist, Etsy, um, places that many consumers can sell their, sell their own goods and or small businesses can. There's so many options out there now for social shopping sites. And you'll see that even Facebook, which technically isn't a social shopping site, has their own area of Facebook marketplace where you can buy and sell goods with each other. So now that we've talked about social media and the role that businesses can play in social media, let's look at blogs or weblogs is what they originally were called. Or um, let's also look at microblogs and participatory journalism. So websites containing individual commentary on current events or specific issues, that's what a blog is. And so Twitter is a microblog because tweets are limited to 280 characters. Early blogs focused on technology topics on which people had, or topics that people had really strong beliefs on. In 2004, we saw the emergence of using blogs um, for political networking and to communicate messages, organize with volunteers, um, raise money and have meetups, etc. Um, so based on the success of social media, retailers started to embrace blogs to engage visitors um, who weren't ready to buy. So if you had a business selling furniture, um, you could actually have a lifestyle blog also that featured that furniture um, or decorating and stuff like that. And it could encourage customers to buy your items without being a full on advertisement. Then there's also um, blogs that can become businesses themselves. And so once they get financial support through advertisers, that can become a business itself. Um, you, we see a lot of lifestyle blogs that work that way, as well as technology blogs. Um, and lastly, participatory journalism. It's the trend towards having readers help write their own news. Another participatory area is open source software. So some open source software is devoted to the development of virtual learning communities, things like Mo Moodle and UPortal. Um, they're developed by a community of programmers who make it available at no cost. And so other programmers use it, they work with it to improve it, and they, su they submit their suggestions or improvements and we're able to continue to grow and build and have really great software with, with no cost to the consumer. There are three types of revenue models for social networking sites. And the first is advertising supported social networking sites. Visitors spend more time in the portal sites than any other type of websites. And that makes it very attractive to advertisers. Other types of social networking sites also draw visitors who spend considerable amount of time at the site. Um, smaller sites with specialized appeal can draw enough visitors to generate um, significant advertising revenue. And this is what we see most often when we open up social media apps and we see advertisements as we're scrolling through. There's also fee-based social networking. And so users pay to be a part of a specific group and to have access to that social network. Um, then there's the mixed revenue and fee-for-service social networking sites. 
And so most social networking sites use advertising, but some charge a fee um, for some of their services. And so when they, when they have both of those combined, that's the mixed revenue. Um, monetizing is the name for converting site visitors into paying subscribers. And um, sometimes that can cause some backlash. You know, if you join a site that's supposed to be a career networking site and you think that that's gonna really help you get your career off the ground, but then you have to pay a fee and you have to pay a fee for this and to get your resume out there to potential um, employers, you have to pay a fee you're going to start to feel a little frustrated and maybe look for a site that isn't fee-based. Let's also look at micro-lending sites and crowdfunding. So micro-lending um, sites, they function as clearing houses for micro-lending activities. Uh, micro-lending is lending small amounts of money to people starting an, and operating a business. Um, key elements is working with a social network of borrowers who support each other and an element of pressure to repay those, those lenders that lent you money. And so um, it's easy to join a micro lending site. Business startups um, and prosperous economies are now using that technology or those techniques that were previously used more in developing countries. Um, we also see a lot of crowdfunding sites. And so crowdfunding small business can, can sell partial ownership in a venture to investors around the world. Um, it relies on many people investing a very small amount. It reduces the risk to individual investors while providing substantial equity for new ventures. Um, and it's reward-based crowdfunding. Investors pay in advance for products and services that may be delivered after they're made with investment funds. Not as common, but worth noting, is internal social networking. And so that uses a company's intranet and it provides social interaction among organization employees. It also includes important information for employees, runs on organizations intranet, um, but can now have wireless connectivity for employees who are traveling. It saves money by replacing printed distributions of information throughout um, the company and it's really great for companies who have a geographically dispersed employees. At the same time that we've been seeing this growth of social networking, we've also been seeing a growth in mobile commerce. And so let's look a little bit at mobile commerce and mobile technologies in general. While cell phones were originally used for making phone calls or SMS, so short messaging services, um, they have evolved and grown and we can do so many more things on our cell phones now, especially mobile commerce. Um, the United States developments um, allowing the phones to be used as web browsers occurred mostly in 2008. And so high-speed mobile telephone networks were available and that grew dramatically. Manufacturers offered a range of smartphones with web browsers, large screens, operating systems, the ability to run applications, and that created the potential for mobile commerce or m-commerce as it's sometimes called. Mobile devices um, include internet capable phones, which first caught on in Japan and South Asia and telecommunication companies there offered high capacity mobile phone networks before the US did. Um, Japan's largest phone company pioneered mobile commerce in 2000. In the United States, the introduction of smartphones and high capacity networks but started around 2008 and has grown rapidly. Um, Apple, iPhone, and Android phones opened the door for some serious US mobile commerce for the first time. And those use mobile device operating systems such as Apple iOS. There's also tablet devices. They're smaller than a laptop computer, but larger than a phone. And they connect to the internet wirelessly through the phone carrier system or a local network such as Wi-Fi. Um, Wireless Application Protocol, WAP, allows HTML web pages to be displayed on small screen devices. While some phones with larger screens and tablets can um, still access regular web pages, it's a good idea to make sure that when you are creating a website that it is also um, user friendly for mobile devices. And that can be very important for a business in making sure that they're not losing customers who some customers may only use their cell phone to make purchases and they maybe don't have a laptop or a desktop computer and that is the only mobile, com mobile commerce is the only e-commerce they're going to take part in. Mobile devices rely very heavily on apps. 
So we'll download a mobile application and that mobile app is what we'll use to access um, information in multiple ways. Some apps provide a gateway to a company's website and some are sold for a small fee, usually under $5. Um, there's things like games, puzzles, all kinds of productivity tools, reference works. Um, there's usually an app for just about everything. Um, you may even access Blackboard on the Blackboard app. Some mobile apps include advertising in their revenue model. Some don't include advertising in their revenue model and those are more likely to you'd have to pay to download those apps. Mobile device use um, for banking financial services is growing. In fact, um, right now, while the while most stores and banks have been shut down or limiting their entrance, um, mobile banking has increased very much. Hospitals and clinics um, oftentimes even provide apps for doctors to get information to their patients. Um, phones, global positioning satellite or GPS services um, create mobile business opportunities. We can also use our phones to pay for things. So mobile payment apps or mobile wallets um, function as credit cards. They've been available since 2004 in Japan, in Japan and really took off here in the United States after around after 2011. In 2011, phone readers were made available to retailers um, for American Express, Visa, and MasterCard, the three main credit cards that are used um, here in the United States. In 2013, Google Wallet um, use had increased. In 2015, in fact, Starbucks attributed its growth um, to customers using its um, mobile app. And so we'll see that with many businesses right now, you can order and pay within their app. So we know that we can use social networks to connect with each other. Businesses can use it to connect with customers. Customers can um, use C2C commerce there. And also business to business, um, there's a lot of opportunities there as well. And so we know that social networking can do that for us. We also know that mobile commerce is just rising and skyrocketing. It's doing great right now. Um, and that brings us to the third part of this chapter, which is online auctions. An auction is when someone, a seller offers an item for sale and provides information to potential buyers, but does not establish a price. The bidders place a bid, say how much they want to pay for it, and it continues to go up while multiple consumers continue to raise their price generally of how much they want to pay. There's also different forms of auction other than the one that I just described. Um, an auctioneer is someone who manages a auction process. And now we see online sites such as eBay that eBay is basically the auctioneer. They're facilitating those auctions taking place between consumers or businesses and consumers. So there is a chart on page 281 that if you take a look at that, it will give the key characteristics of the different types of auctions, but I will go over those quickly. In an English auction, you start from the lowest price and the bidding increases until no bidder is willing to bid any higher. In a Dutch auction, you're gonna be starting from a high price, bidding automatically decreases until the bidder accepts the price. Um, a first price sealed bid auction is secret bidding process and the highest bidder pays the amount of the highest bid. You'll see this sometimes with um, fundraisers. You'll see a library have a silent auction where you all go write the price that you're willing to pay for that item. Second price sealed bid auction is a secret bidding process and the highest bidder pays the amount of the second highest price. A double auction is when buyers and sellers declare combined prices and quantity bids. The auctioneer matches the seller's offers, the lowest to highest with buyer's offers low, highest to lowest. Buyers and sellers can modify bids and based on knowledge gained from other bids. Double sealed auction, buyers and sellers declare combined price quantity bids. The auctioneer or specialist matches the seller's offers with the lowest and highest and um, buyers and sellers cannot modify their bids. A reverse auction is a seller bid. So multiple sellers submit price bids to an auctioneer that represents a single uh, buyer. The bids are for a given amount of, for, of a specific item that the buyer wants to purchase. Prices go down as the bidding continues until no seller is willing to bid lower. And on that one, you are likely to see that one in the business world for um, 
to get the items that you need in your supply chain eBay. So many electronic marketplaces conduct those business-to-business -to -business transactions. It can reduce purchasing costs, reverse auctions, cause suppliers to compete um, or, pri um, or price you know, differently than they normally would. One of the negative things is that it replaces that relationship that you create in the business-to-business -business environment with your suppliers. Um, this can be okay for things that are uh, that are commodities, things that you need to just buy a lot of. So then there's also auction escrow services. And that is when buyer's common concern is the reliability of the seller. And so when you're purchasing a high value item, an escrow service can be used to protect buyer's interests. Um, an independent party holds payment until buyer receives item and is satisfied with it. Some escrow services take delivery and perform the inspection if they're qualified to do so. Bidders at low price auctions won't be paying for an escrow service. Instead, um, they would need to be checking the seller's record and on the auction site or on other sites. And so businesses have to do a little bit of research on the businesses they work with, just the same way that consumers need to do research on the businesses that they um, buy and sell from. So let's discuss a few t key takeaways from this chapter. And so some of those key takeaways is the evolution of social media and social networking, um, starting from virtual communities all the way to the social networking that we know today. Um, another one is that social networking websites earn revenue through ads, through advertisement. There are those three revenue models and um, we need to think about those from both the business side and the consumer side because as businesses we need to be looking at the consumer side so that we can have consumer centric ideas and planning and um, and focus our revenue model on what's going to meet the needs of consumers and what's going to um, increase the business that we will receive from consumers it's also important to be looking at the mobile technologies that are being used and how we're able to meet the needs for consumers and for other businesses through mobile commerce and the growth of mobile commerce because it is growing so quickly. That's something that you really need to keep an eye on and be very aware of the technology needs um, required for mobile commerce. We also learned in this lecture that online auctions are important not just for the consumer to consumer side or business to consumer side, but especially for business to business and, um, and how that plays a role in e-commerce. And that pretty much sums up this chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, be sure to look over the different charts and pictures that are in the chapter because those will help you get a very good visual understanding of the growth of social networking as well as the details of different forms of mobile commerce and auctions and other forms of e-commerce.